Good morning, everybody. There we go. Uh, hope you all had a very pleasant uh, sleep, and we've ordered up a beautiful California day for you to enjoy. Don't tell that. a little bit so you can see outside, and hopefully it will last for the rest of the day for you to enjoy. And thank you for the evening. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, I'd like to add my thanks. Um, we got this invitation some time ago, and uh, immediate, I immediately said yes because it was such a fantastic invitation. And actually, it's lived up to expectations or exceeding expectations, I think, in um, uh, meeting people who I would never normally meet and hearing presentations I would never normally hear. So, thank you very much, organisers, for. for um, it, organizing this and uh, inviting us and for last night a manic <laughs> although I was a bit spaced out some of the time with the jet lag but um, it was a lovely event last night so um, I'm going to tell you a story and uh, you will know some of it because you've lived through it yourselves but hopefully it will put a new perspective on what's happened over the last 20 years or so um, I'm basically we split the semantic web session into two obviously um, I'm going to tell you the story of the web, effectively. Um, and I will talk about the semantic web, but Nigel's going to do the detail of what it actually means and actually what's happening in the linked data world. So I will skirt through that a bit as I take you through the story. Um, as I said in the paper, there's, this is the, the ideas that are encapsulated in the web are not new. And I started my research in 1987 by reading this paper. I can't remember who suggested I read it because there wasn't a web in those days to, to browse and find things on. Do you remember the days when you had to go to a library or be recommended to read or somebody sent you a paper in the post to read? Um, somebody, I cannot remember who, recommended I read this paper. How many of you have read it? Come on, be lively. This How many? About oh, less than half, actually. That's surprising from this group. We should all have read it. <laughs> um, uh, Bush, um, the uh, scientific advisor to Roosevelt and the war, he wrote this seminal paper, as we may think, published just at the end of the war, uh, when he foresaw the need for machines to help us manage information. Um, he never really wrote about this again, although he is considered the grandfather of hypertext, in a sense. People have been writing about linking information for centuries. Um, but with paper or uh, oral histories, it's actually quite difficult to do. The brain does it very well. Uh, we have the power of associative thinking. And that's what Banavar Bush was picking up in his paper, the idea that we would use machines to help us as an extension to our brains, really, to help us store information and then to find it. He talks about trails. He talks about webs. Um, so he's talking about networks, uh, but it, the idea is that his, his main thesis in the paper is that we need better systems than hierarchical indexing to store the information, and we need to think about how our brains retrieve information and try and, and use that as a, a way of uh, developing new systems, and that inspired me, that's basically been the paper that I, I've been trying to build a system like that ever since, and uh, we still, we're still, well, actually, we're sort of getting there. And I put, in the paper I wrote, I've made an interesting point that um, these people, uh, Ted and Doug, um, who I'm sure 
you will all have heard of, um, were inspiring us to think about using computers, because Bush's idea was a mechanical device. It was really microfiche. He hadn't thought about the computer in that sense. Ted, um, who coined the terms hypertext and hypermedia, the idea of using a computer to link from one piece of information to another. Um, he, the phrase, everything is deeply intertwingled, uh, is his phrase. Um, and of course it is. Um, and Doug, whose system uh, he caught, was called Augment, Doug uh, at Stanford, just up the road, came up with the, well, really inspired all of us to think about using, the gra developing graphical user interfaces, quite revolutionary in the 60s, that you would point it and click on a, on a screen and go to another piece of information over a network, live demo in San Francisco in 1968. He called it Augment, the idea of augmenting the brain. This wasn't a replacement, it wasn't AI. In that sense, it was storing infant, we, you know, we, we might store it up here, but we can't always find it again. Um, but certainly there was going to be more than we, than we could store in a, our brain. So they were, and Bush's system in the paper is called Memex or Memory Extender. So these are all thinking of um, extensions augmenting the brain. And these people inspired us. And what I was going to say was that it's very interesting that as the, their visions are becoming a reality, and the kids today no, 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 don't know a world without the web, without Facebook, and the neuroscientists are beginning to say, this is changing how the brains work. Fun, you know, they can't do linear thinking. Or they can only jump all over the place. And I think it's quite ironic that these guys wanted to get us to jump all over the place because they felt that would be a useful thing to do. And so there's, there's an interesting irony in that's emerging. But these were the people that in, inspired me to, um, to, to get into this world. And uh, also this man. Um, so what do India, the Urban Matna Burma, the University of Southampton, my research career have in common? Well, basically, in 1987, which was a seminal year for both me as a researcher, I was just a, a junior uh, lecturer at Southampton then, and here's me in 1987 with the Mountbatten Archive. Um, people say that's my shoe collection. <laughs> <laughs> I make that joke every time because it's a different audience. It's you're it's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think I brought most of them here with me, judging by the weight of the suitcase. Um, <laughs> this is how we used to access information, right? This is, this is Lord Earl Mountbatten of Burma's archive. In 1987, uh, he, they lived, the family just lived up the road from uh, Broadlands, um, just 10 miles north of Southampton. And, and when he died, uh, his archive was given to Southampton to look after it. We don't own it. Um, there's a lot of debate about who owns it and how much money it's worth to keep it in the country. But that's another story. Um, basically, this, this was how it arrived in boxes and archivists looked through it. And I had, I thought I was linking these ideas of this hypertext world in those days, uh, there was no digital video, uh, no web. The internet was there. We were doing email. But we were using the old analog video disks, if any of you remember those. Um, and we didn't even really use the term multimedia. But the idea was that we would digitize, create electronic versions, I think we used to call it in 1987, um, this information. And so I was trying to tie these ideas together and saying, I would, it, wouldn't it be wonderful? What I'm doing is looking at a picture we did basically the India piece is because he was the last viceroy of India, and we we did we 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 digitised the two years that he was the last viceroy of India because it was a nice self-contained piece of his life, and I think I'm looking at a picture that was taken in uh, Viceroy House in Delhi or something. I, the idea was to link the minutes of meetings to the pictures that were taken at the meetings and allow the historians to find their way around all this information, and we wanted to create different links for different people, i.e. capture different relationships um, for, so that school children would be looking for different information in this archive than your expert researchers. So why would they want the same links? So we tried, we set about designing a system we called Microcosm, and I learned several lessons. One is never to call your system the name of an English word, a normal English word, because Every time I hear someone talk about a microcosm, I think they're talking about our system, which of course they aren't. Um, 
Uh, there's some old 35 mil slides of the demo. I'm not going to go into it in any detail. The key thing was that at the time we were storing our links in a separate database. So we were capturing the relationships between the different pieces of information. This is very important as we go through to the semantic web because I didn't know it then, but I was actually, we were actually doing something that wasn't going to become real for another 20 years. Um, but basically the, the idea was you had a, you know, this picture links to this uh, piece of text because. So all the uh, links were triples, they were source uh, destination, description, doesn't really matter what order you put them in. Um, and we also used to do very clever things like work out from the context of the document or the picture or the application or the user profile what links were wanted and we would patch in and out different link bases and actually did it had a patent on that. Uh, little knowing that the world was moving to open source and patents on software was pretty useless but it's still an interesting patent that we have. And we were actually doing things like making, using the metadata. So there was an interesting discussion about we'd have loved the Amazon Mechanical Turk because what you can't do is get people to add metadata to documents. Come back to that later. We, we, had, we paid people to create metadata and they still didn't do it. But anyway, when we could get metadata, we used that to generate links between documents and it all sort of amazingly rich uh, hypertext environments came from this. And I had the concept of sharing links, sharing relationships, um, publishing those. Uh, so anyway, that was, that was the work we were doing. And um, at the same time, this man, Tim Berners-Lee, was sitting in CERN writing this paper. This is Tim's famous um, proposal he, he put to the management at CERN it actually says March, I think, 1989. Uh, so we celebrated the 20th anniversary of this last year. It says, and that what, wrote, what his manager, Mike Sendel, um, who has to be credited as much with the web as Tim almost, when Tim sent in this document, which was really proposing, it didn't call it the web. He was writing a system called Explorer. I don't suppose you can read the word, Inquire, rather. Um, but he has the term, I haven't got my pointer, Here's the hypertext piece of the system here. Um, and uh, it's quite a confused document, actually, uh, when you look back at it now. But um, like a lot of... Oh, I'm not on video, I won't say it. Um, but the um, Mike wrote on, uh, on it, vague but exciting. And those words enabled Tim to go away and, as part of his day job, develop the web. Which is why CERN claims to be the you know, where the web was invented, which it was. He was working at CERN, and he was given the time to do it. So this was 1989, and we did our first demo of Microcosm in 1989. There were several, it was a very timely moment in the development of these, these global networks because the internet was there. People were beginning to use it. And if you remember, any of you who can remember back to those days, we were using systems like Gopher and WACE and FTP, Thank you. Is this a... Yeah, thank you. A Just thank you. The, the battery had run out in mine. Thank you, Peter. Right, that's where it says hypertext there. There's two words, actually, interestingly. Ted would have had a fit. Um, so we were using Gopher, Waste, FTP. Uh, we, were, we were hungry to share documents. We were ready to share documents. The, the internet exists as a, um, as a network of computers. We wanted to share information on it. So there were many systems bubbling up and I think this is often the same in computer science. You see it today with the cloud. Everybody has a cloud. It's like it's the time to do that sort of thing. This was the time to create a global hypertext system, which, of course, Ted had been predicting for 30 years or so, 20 years. So we all went off to Paris in 1990 to the, European, the first European conference on hypertext. The, the first ACM hypertext conference was in uh, 1987. But this is the conference where I first met Tim. And... Uh, so there he is, and uh, this, is, this is an interesting point about when you have, you're meeting people, you're networking in a face-to-face -face way, like we all seem to want to do, and there's Tim explaining how big his links are, probably, He's talking about, he didn't, I don't think it was called the web then, and this is my colleague Andrew Fountain, who was the uh, co-author uh, of our first paper, Microcosm, that's Robert Caillou, who was Tim's co-colleague at CERN, 
and developing the web. This is my PhD student, Ian, who, wore, who uh, wrote the first version of Microcosm. This is Ian's leather jacket here. That's the link, and that's me. <laughs> so, that's where I met Tim. But the point was, he was talking about the web. We were talking about Microcosm, and the, the, we, were, we were talking about the same but very different things, and we really didn't hear each other. Do, do you know what I mean? It was quite... Um, he, he said to me about a year ago, Wendy, if only, you'd listen, if only you'd understood about the web in those days, microcosm would have been the front end to it. And I still haven't quite worked that one out. But um, uh, he also didn't hear. He, he heard what we said about the relationships that links were. But his argument was, you get, you'll, people will lose them if you put them in separate databases. You've got to embed them in the documents, which to me was... God, that's so clunky and, and old-fashioned to embed your links in documents. Anyway, so uh, the next year we went to, um, we came to Texas for the ACM Hypertext Conference, and this was the conference that famously rejected Tim and Robert's paper about the web. Um, <laughs> so this is when the Hypertext community turned its back on the web, sort of. But um, uh, as Tim would say, it wasn't a very good research paper, <laughs> but, of course, it was. He was talking about something that was going to change our lives, only we didn't realise it then. I haven't got any photos from this, and possibly because I remember two things about it. They rejected Tim's paper, but they also rejected our paper. So what do you do when you have a paper rejected? You submit a demo. So uh, we, we were there. Tim and Robert were demoing the web. It's the first time I... He called, they were the calling it the World Wide Web then, and I thought that, God, how arrogant can you get to call it the World Wide Web? <laughs> I can remember thinking that. And they were, like, two up from us at, on the, in the demo booths, and we were demoing Microcosm. And the other thing I remember was... This was Texas, San Antonio, and outside in the courtyard was a tequila fountain. So you could get margaritas on tap. <laughs> so... There weren't very many people looking at the demos. <laughs> so, so uh, this, you know, this was like, in retrospect, a seminal moment. This was the first time the World Wide Web was demonstrated in America. But not de very many people saw it. Tim had to pay, I think, for the phone line to do the demo over. Um, and uh, so I can remember standing over his shoulder with some of the others from the hypertext community that were still stuck in the demo room and saying, this is noth there's nothing new here. This isn't going to go anywhere, right? This will not go anywhere. By the next hypertext conference in, uh, in America in 93, half the demos were the World Wide Web. And, of course, it, it, the rest, as they say, is history. I thought I'd put this slide in because... Oh, no, sorry, this slide in. Because... Um, so this is, again, he loves this pose, seemingly. These are the pictures you get off the web about him. And I was realising when I was talking, I think it was to Bruno on the first, when we arrived on the th uh, Thursday night, that many people don't know how the web is run these days. Uh, what Tim did in 94, when it was starting to take off, and I'll come back to, to why in a minute, why it took off, he set up the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, which you can see the logo, so this was taken, I think, in the year they were setting it up. Probably he's just arrived. So he moved from CERN to Boston. That's when he moved to MIT. And Michael Detousis at MIT really was, was hugely instrumental in, in the, you know, the, making the web happen because he, found, you know, he and um, George Metakides and a couple of other people found the money for the chair that Tim sits on at MIT, the three co-founders chair, which is in his office. Um, and... Uh, and he set up W3C. Now, W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, is the, is the body that, that develops the standards for the World Wide Web. Not a lot of people know that, as Michael Caine would say. It's a very quiet organisation, but everything that we do, from the way the browser's developed to things like putting photos and video... Because if you remember, the early web was read-only text. There was nothing else, and links. Um, the no so put a photo on, put a video on, all the things that the interaction that has enabled the blogs and the wikis and everything about the social networking has all come from the standards that were developed by W3C. It's paid for by people who be become members of it. Big companies join it for a very small subscription, runs on a complete shoestring. And if you go to MIT, basically this is just a, sm a room about as big as that with a few people in. It's nothing. You've been there. There's nothing there. 
There's another lab in France, in Rio. There's one in Tokyo. And there are several centers around the world. But these are, it is run on a complete shoestring. And it actually works because it works over the internet in the same way that the internet protocols work. Everybody meets electronically and agrees things by slow, laborious processes. These are all volunteers who work out the details of the standards. They don't all uh, work well. Some of them flop. But all the things that we do with the web are because of that organization that they had the vision to set up in 1994. And it needs your support now. Um, but anyway, so that's, if you like, what happened. And the other lessons we had to learn, apart from his vision of how to make this work in a relatively democratic way, were the things that we missed was that with, the, with hypertext, the network was absolutely everything. And he will say this over and over again. Many of us were working on hypertext systems that were based on workstations. Uh, may or may not have been connected to the network, but the thing was the hypertext was on the hard disk on the computer, and you shared it by sending files to other people. The, his, the clever thing about the real thing that he captured that others didn't at the time was it had to work over a global network or everybody had to use it or nobody would. And that was, that was the breakthrough moment, really. Second thing that I list, there are lots of things, but the second thing is that Scruffy works. At the time, a lot of hypertext researchers, not necessarily ourselves, but there were the Hyper-G system at uh, Graz, for, in, for example, made every link correct. It was, uh, we sort of proved there were hypertext papers that proved that users would not use a hypertext system if there were links in it that, that were dead or dangling or led to the wrong information. So we had systems, we had lots of research about making the links correct. Link integrity, it was called, it still is. But, and of course, in some examples, it absolutely has to be. If you take, you know, security examples, real time, you know, you would want your hypertext system on a plane, whatever you're using, to work perfectly. But... Basically, because we're not perfect as human beings, we're happy for our system that we're using not to be perfect, because we're sort of used to that. We're used to not always finding the information we want at the right time. So we don't mind that some of the links fail, because most of the time it works and it's good enough. So it's the scruffy works, which was a really important lesson for us to learn. And the third one, so many of us at the time, including ourselves, were trying to create proprietary systems that we were going to sell and hope to become Bill Gates. And, uh, I mean, that's why people invested in our system. This is long before the, it's long before the web, because they thought they were going to be the next Bill Gates, uh, a system that would take over the world. And, and Tim said, if I don't give it away, if it's not free, with open standards, open and universal standards, it won't work. Again, it's the everybody has to use it or nobody will. And that's so important going forward. To, that we've learned that lesson um, in a very short space. You know, it's only 15, 16 years ago since it really hit the world in, in 94. Um, Tim's first... Tim doesn't get everything right. His, uh, the um, interface, his user interface for the web at CERN wasn't just a browser, as we call it today. It was also an editor. Because he argued that if people couldn't write to the web in natural language i.e. without learning HTML, they wouldn't use it. He thought it would need to be a read-write system. In fact, of course, we were all perfectly happy to just play around with reading it to start with because it was better than anything else that was there. And actually, it was Mosaic. It was the uh, people at NCSA who developed Mosaic, and Mark Andreas and his team, a Mosaic that became uh, Netscape, which was a, a very, very simple, bed down to the the lowest common denominator to enable you to just click on something, type in an address or click on a link and move to another document, as simple as that, down to the bare bones of the web, if you like, and that's what enabled it to take off. Um, we lost the clever stuff, but that's coming back again in the semantic web, so we'll look at that, the sort of developing relationships um, in a way... Because so the web, to me, is a, very, is a strangely linkless world. Although it's a hypertext system. If I remember setting my students' essays to say, is the web a hypertext system? Because actually, to some of the sort of old definitions of what hypertext was, it wasn't a hypertext system. 
All hypertrophic systems in those days, really, if they were going to be anything, were bidire had bidirectional linking. And the web was unidirectional, so you couldn't go back to where you'd come from. And we had research papers that said you get, lo you get lost. <laughs> well, you do, actually. And the other <laughs> but it didn't matter, because you were exploring this new universe, and it was all better than you'd had before. Um, and uh, the other thing, of course, once it gets over a certain size, so if you think about it then, there was, you know, the, when the web started, and Tim will talk about this, he can remember writing in his logbook the 26th web server that was set up. Because in those days, there wasn't a web to download things from, so you had to email Tim to get the code, and then he put it up on the, uh, so you could get it down on the Unix system. But he remembers writing in the 26th, and then he lost count. <coughs> of course, now there are billions of them. And, and you know, you realize when you get to that size that you have to have something other than following hypertext links to be able to find the information. So the search engines were an inevitability, but they didn't exist. So if you remember the early days of, what did you used to use? AltaVista. Alta Lycos was around. Yeah, hmm? yeah there, were, there were several that emerged because very quickly, when you saw the documents appear, and the web was very boring to start with, but, but it sort of caught fire in universities, because I can remember by 94, we'd put our student coursework up on the web, because it was very easy for the students to get at it. Um, but to explain to people that the vast majority of people, that they, sh like companies, um, or universities as organizations, or governments, that they should put their information onto the web, transfer everything to HTML, and go through the effort of doing that, they'd say, why should I bother? What's the point? Now you wouldn't even ask. I can remember talking to our university um, administration team, the, the marketing team, and saying you really should be thinking about inf putting information about the university on the web so that people in other countries can read it and decide if they want to come to Southampton. They'd go, why? Who's got the web? Well, of course, that nobody did. It's like the invention of the printing press. You, didn't, you couldn't make much money from printing books when people couldn't read. So you weren't going to make much money or you weren't going to reach many people by putting stuff onto the web when there's nobody to read it. So it's this chicken and egg situation that you have to get through all the time on the web, and it's incredibly complex, and we don't understand it, and come back to that later. So... Um, the search engines were inevitability once you got over a certain size. Um, I, w I just want to come back to this web as a strangely linked this world. In the early days, well, even now, you know how hard it is to maintain a website, if, you know, to make it professional looking, to decide what to link to what and how to maintain those links. The links decay incredibly quickly, and it's a very hard job to do. Creating a website is the easiest thing in the world these days. I mean, 94 was a great business in helping people build, develop websites, but you know, now it's, anyone can do it. But actually, the content, which makes it alive, and, making, and the links, making the links, the hard things to keep up to date. So, in fact, people pull back from making links in the web. You have navigation links and menus and things, but actually, the associative linking that Vannevar Bush was talking about, the, the rich relationships between information are extremely difficult in the... Um, in the document web. And we'll come back to that again with what's happening with the semantic web. So the search engines were inevitability. And of course, the, these guys came to dominate totally. And I'm sure you all know the story. They um, published their paper in 97, I think it was, in the World Wide Web Conference, which was by then there'd been six of them because there were two a year to start with because it was all sort of people trying to learn about what was going on. And they published, Brin and Page published their algorithm for um, basically the page ranking algorithm for their idea of how you could find things on the web by using not just an, an, an analyzing the text in the documents, but by analyzing the links in the web. Remember the point about the web is a strangely linkless pay, place. So, but, but Google depends on the links we make to make its, the results of its search more accurate. You know, what, if you find that some documents, you, they rank them by seeing what points. So this is, this is power on the web. It's the, you know, if you are the site that's pointed to by more than anybody else, you're going to be the top of Google without even paying for it. Um, so they do this, and then everyone says, lovely idea, guys, but it isn't going to scale. So they've done the maths, and then they have to go away and do the engineering. 
and without any money, find, you know, buy, borrow computers and start proving that they could make it scale. And the idea in those days of, as by then, by, the, by 99 when they started to do this, the web was quite large and everyone was thinking, how could you possibly build something that's going to harvest the web day after day after day? But they did, they proved they could do it, then they couldn't, find, they couldn't make any money. So they came up with the idea, I'm shortening the whole story, of auctioning words effectively. So people, they, you know, bid to be the top link according to a particular search term. And they've come to hugely dominate our lives in very different ways. And the I, I could say a lot about Google, but the interesting thing here is that they um, are diametrically opposed almost to, to in, in the way the company runs to the way the web was founded. Because the web is on an open and free model, open standards, uh, non-proprietary, and Google does everything with, in a very closed Google world, and nobody gets access to their standards. And it's very interesting how this has developed, I think. So this is, um, one of my PhD students drew this curve, and it's the nicest one. You can find lots of growth of the web things, but it tells the story so well. And this is an important thing, because we're, gonna, we're actually living through this bit with the semantic web now. So web, the growth of things on the web tend to follow these types of graphs, and we see them over and over again. This is the hosts and users, hosts and users, and you get this sort of uh, phase where no one's using it and someone's had a bright idea, but you can't persuade anyone to use it because nobody else is using it. And then you come to some sort of, somehow the standards become core. So this is language, this is not our language, this is language from other subjects becomes core, and then you reach the tipping points. And understanding what these tipping points are is something that we think is fundamental going forward. Interesting thing here, if you look where the dot-com bubble was here, broadband didn't, well, I don't know if this is UK or US, but basically broadband doesn't appear till around here. This is one of the major tipping points, because this is when people start buying computers at home. Because before that, we used to call it the World Wide Wait, because it took so long to find anything uh, when you were dialing up. This is when it starts to take off. But, of course, the dot-com bubble had already burst, really, because they, they, they were trying to sell into a market that didn't exist. So it was great ideas, but what, ahead of their time. Um, but the companies that have emerged as the winners had started to emerge, like Amazon and eBay. And um, I saw Meg Whitman on last night. She's gone into politics. Is that yeah. California? Yeah? No? Yeah, anyway. Um, sorry, eBay. <laughs> um, uh, so, that, you know, and you've got the um, browser wars and, you know, the stories about when Bill Gates decided he was gonna be, they were going to become a network company, all those things basically um, tipped it over. The existence of Google tipped it over to become what it is today. And I sort of, you, I've talked about read-only, read-write, and now we're in the phase of the social web that has emerged. And uh, all these things are driven by changes in the technology and changes in the standards. Um, because when you couldn't write to the web, you're not going to have a social web. That relies on people being able to put type in English or whatever their language is, in natural language, put photos and videos on. If you couldn't do that, then it wasn't a very exciting place to be in a social, the sort of social networks we see today. But also, you think about, I think about the web in phases, three, five-year phases. So the first phase of the web... There wasn't much on there. So if you played around on the web, you'd be, you'd be pleasantly surprised if you found something that you were looking for. In the second sort of phase of the web, um, if you were looking around for things, you would hope to find the things that you were looking for. Now, when you look on the web, you expect to find the things that you're looking for. It has changed like that. Um, now, I need to speed up a bit, but we're basically uh, in this world now. We've had quite a bit of talk about over the last day about wikis and blogs and, and you can see all these things. These things, as I said, develop as the standards and the technology develop. You couldn't have had YouTube in the first days of the web because you, you didn't have the standards to put the video onto the web. Um, these, of course, are the subject of a lot of analysis and debate and uh, privacy and trust and what's happening to our kids and so on. I want to just... Um, and actually, no one's, I don't think anyone's mentioned Second Life so far. 
I don't think anyone... I did, did you? Well. I was asleep. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> I stand completely I s uh, corrected. Um, I did tell Nosh to hit me when I fall as fell asleep. Nosh, but... you don't need to hit her because she snores. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure that you did not. <laughs> so, um, but the, the, but the point I'll make, forgive me, Bruno, is um, that actually, of course, it's not its time. Because the technology... The, the, when the cloud develops, and or maybe well, <laughs> there's a lot of misnomers there, but as processing power develops, and uh, we get more powerful machines, and we can, you know, we can exist more in a in a in a virtual reality world, it may or may not be second life, but things like that will become dominant. But it's not the time yet, and that will be another phenomenon for networking, of course. When you're, you know, you're increasingly living in a digital world, some people may suspend their physical world and only live in a digital world. You know, when these things really develop. So, uh, uh, but, but it's the, the, the time isn't quite there yet. We can see what might happen, but the time is there. But Twitter's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, I think um, you said yesterday about Twitter, Karina. It was a that it was last year, it was actually July, the summer before, 2008, when it started to take off. And I don't know if you can all remember, because it seems like we all, we've known it forever. When these things are there, you, you feel like you've never not known about Twitter. Um, but if, I don't know if you can remember when you first started to hear about Twitter. This is the curve. Oh, no, sorry, that's Wikipedia. I'll come back to that. So this is the... The red, it's not, I must get this redrawn, it's not very clear. This, the red is the growth of Twitter. And, and this is a student of Nigel's, actually, who's gone back to China. He drew this before he, he went for us. And there's things on here very specific to us, like this is where Nigel went on Twitter. It's almost the same time as Stephen Fry. They're in very good company. In, <laughs> in the UK, if you ask people when did they first hear about Twitter, it was when Stephen Fry, who's a famous comedian in the UK, you, you know of him here, I think, um, uh, got stuck in a lift, famously got stuck in a lift, and he twittered that um, he was stuck in a lift. And the media wrote about that. Um, and then you've got here, you've got the Mumbai attacks, you've got the presidential election, the uh, miracle on the Hudson, the Australian bushfires. So that Sarah Brown is our Prime Minister's wife, who's going to help him win, try and help him win the election by twittering. Um, uh, swine flu. I, this is me here. I'm a very late adopter, right? Uh, with the swine flu, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the, 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 so there's lots of things, and I, the, the, what I'm going to say next doesn't prove anything, but I think it's very interesting that the green graph is, is the growth of the 3G is of the iPhone. And to me, and this isn't true for everybody, the only reason I started Twitter was when I bought my iPhone, I could Twitter on the move. And professional Twitterers, I'm told, Twitter on their desk laptops because they're controlling their tweet decks and... You know, but actually, I just want to tweet the odd thing, and I do it on my iPhone. And I think, so we, we have to track the technology as much as we track the, um, uh, the social media. It's terribly important. Just going back to Wikipedia, this was something that, um, you know, nobody really predicted. And it's still, it's, it's the subject, and will be the subject for a long time, of a lot of study as to how it works, how it's evolving, how, what the rules are, how the rules are evolving. <laughs> And will it continue to exist? Um, when Jimmy Wells and uh, his colleague, I can't remember his name, founded it, people were very sceptical, including Jimmy Wales. It says that on Wikipedia, so it must be true. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I can remember in the early days of the web or before the web, we used to talk about online dictionaries and online encyclopedias. And I remember distinctly thinking, yeah, we'll have, that would be fantastic and we'll pay. You know, we will buy a license to get the OED and we'll link to it um, on the network. Never thought of this idea of, you know, people creating an online encyclopedia um, and it being corrected because everybody's looking at it. And so, actually, when they do the studies, I'm sure you know this, the, uh, the accuracy rate for Wikipedia is no worse than for the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, partly because when, you know, when, when there are mistakes... It gets corrected, somebody points it out. But increasingly, there's a, there's a bureaucracy growing up with Wikipedia. And that's, you know, it's an interesting debate as to how that's going to go forward. Twitter. Um, we were talking about the uh, Amazonian, Amazon Mechanical Turk over breakfast. And 
This is another example of citizen science where people, you know, the scientists are getting people who aren't scientists to, um, to do, do science, to classify galaxies, for example. And what's happening at the moment is where we're going, just as we were hungry to get shared documents, we're now hungry to share data and do things with metadata. We had the, we sh the science map project is all about analysing metadata. We are absolutely ready for that. And this leads us to the world of the semantic web. And for a long time, if I got there, the semantic web is a web of data. And that's the key thing to remember, because when, it start, when we start, it's always been part of Tim's vision. And he published this, you know, technical um, uh, roadmap with Jim Hendler in 99, but he wrote about it in, the, in his Weaving the Web book. He said it was part of my original vision. He spoke about it at the first web conference. Called it the semantic web, which he bit regrets nowadays, because it went very much off into a, an artificial intelligence rat hole, as I call it, where, because it was all about sharing data, and if you're going to share data, you have to give it some context, because the number 42 doesn't mean anything, unless you've read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, you have to set it in the context of some vocabulary and ontology. And, and you have to have, you know, you certainly have to know how much you trust uh, the person or the algorithm that, that's given you that data. But um, the, um, the semantic web world evolved very much out of the artificial intelligence world and got very quickly into description logics and trying to solve problems that the AI field have been trying to solve for ages. A lot of natural language processing, which is fraught with problems. And so it sort of slowed it all down, and we began to realize that, um, collectively, Tim leading it, that we had to concentrate on this being a web of data, linked data. And actually, the RDFs are triples, and this is the key. This comes back to my, the early days about the links we had, um, is that it's, they're triples. Um, the subject, predicate, object, um, the relationship. So we're coming back to the hypertext vision, I think, that the um, early pioneers had. Um, Nigel, that you can look at T Tim talking about uh, the semantic web, linked data web at TED, but Nigel's going to talk to you all about this. We wrote a paper, um, Semantic Web Revisited. These are the building blocks of the semantic web, which Nigel will take you through. And the key things are the URI, the, uni the, the URL, which is a, an address on a machine, becomes a URI, which is an identifier, it's an abstract notion. The um, RDF is the Resource Description Framework, gives you the way of the standard, the universal standard for sharing metadata. You're still going to use the same HTTP protocol for passing things over the network. So that's really what it's all about. And you link everything and you, it, using your ontology. But that can be very simple to start with. Here's an example of what we do. Um, the school, Electronics Computer Science, we come from, this is, this is not my home page, but it's the page that describes me from the databases that we have. Um, and if you look, this is it blown up, we export all our data from the school. Every one of us has an identifier, that's me, that's my number, according to ECS. This is me in RDF. That's for all the people, courses, students, uh, projects, publications. All that information is out there against an ontology that we publish. So if a machine comes along, uh, the pr a machine can read that and see the graph of every, everything, who we, who we are and what we do. Yeah, Resource description framework. It's like the HTML of this new world. Nigel will take you through it a lot in a lot more detail. Um, so it's really very simple. Um, and just imagine, what you have to do now is suspend belief and imagine that every university in the whole world exposes all the data about what they do. So their professors, their courses, their projects, their publications in this, in this standard way. When everybody does it, then you can start... The machines can aggregate all that information because it's a standard that they can read. And you can start asking questions like, where can I study journalism? So you can be sitting in Australia and type, you know, where do I study journalism? And get an answer back. And you can say, where's the best place to study journalism? I'll just take this example because I'm standing here. Right? And there's, you know, that's the sort of world we're going to have in the future when everybody's doing it. 
But if, if governments do it. Sorry? If governments is do that it, exactly? it's political transparency. And that's what Nigel's going to talk about in his talk. So this isn't here yet, but we think it's on the way, and Nigel will talk more about that. This is the growth. Again, I expect Nigel will have these slides. Uh, the amount of triples out there is growing, and Nigel will have the latest data for you. There are areas... I must speed up because I'm nearly finished, but uh, Nigel's going to cover all this. It is growing, but it's not big enough yet to have that mass impact. We think we just got to the tipping point. So DBpedia is a big one. This is All the facts in Wikipedia are available in RDF. So all our students use this as a, a classic example. You link into Wikipedia. So the BBC, for example, who produce their catalogue of music in RDF, they've got a Beethoven sonata they've got a, a copy of that they, they, you know, the BBC Symphony Orchestra has made. They don't have to produce a biography of Beethoven. They link to Wikipedia because that's all there in RDF too. And it all just joins up. And you'll see a lot more of that with um, for Nigel. The interesting thing, for, though, this is a... A project, uh, this is Networks of Networks, this is a res the Resist project that uh, uh, the science people are doing similar things. We are pulling together all the information about who's published what, who's doing what project, and you can track over time the research, that who's doing what research, who's working with who, you can see trends. These are very exciting things. The difficult thing is the user interface. We haven't really nailed that yet, so what that's going to be. There's an interesting, um, if you do this for... Me, as an academic, a link to Wikipedia, it will tell you that I played tennis at Wimbledon in 1967. I didn't, but there was a Wendy Hall that played tennis at Wimbledon in 1967. So the, the co-reference problem is a big problem, but I'm not going to... Uh, the dame is you. Huh? The dame is me, yeah. <laughs> she, the, the tennis player wasn't made a dame. I don't think she won anything, but never mind. Um, so we are at the tipping point, we think, but we haven't... Um, the, the, um, and the government data is the tipping point. And again, this is what Nigel's going to focus on. The um, Obama government has uh, made an announcement l uh, last year about using the semantic web for, to put the data out about the, uh, the money they were pumping into the uh, save the economy and how it was going to be spent. And... Uh, yeah. So that, that was a big announcement about... They were going, and they're still... This is why Jim Henner's not here, because he's in Washington talking about this, uh, what he was in Washington yesterday. Um, and this is uh, Nigel and Tim with uh, somebody who you might recognise in the middle when they were called to number 10 to do... Uh, and he, this is what Nigel's going to talk about, to put public data out in this format for more transparent government. I won't tell you any more about that, just to say this is, because Nigel's going to cover it, but this is a tipping point moment, because the work that's gone on and data.gov was launched in January, this will drive other governments to do this. It'll be one of the major tipping points in this area. Once the governments are doing it, the research world's already doing it, then we'll see companies doing it. And in a year or two, this will become the norm. But you won't see it like we did with the web because it will be machine to machine to start with. And you may actually find, you may find you're using it by using an iPhone app. You, you won't know you're using this. You will get things like train timetables. You'll be able to say, when's the next train to Newcastle, if you're in the UK? Get an answer back. You won't know you're using the linked data web, but you will be. So, this, um, so we've gone from, I'm just going to finish with two minutes on web science so that you know what we've done with this. Um, we've gone from a web of documents to the social web, to tomorrow the web of linked data. And we don't understand what this is going to be. And we, we can't predict what people are going to do with it because we can't predict human behavior. What is Web 3.0 going to be? So back in 2006, we, um, Tim and Nigel and I and Danny Weitzner launched this thing called Web Science because we felt that we needed to study the web as a network of networks, if you like. And it's a network of the technology and people, socio-technical, and policy makers too, because it's a technology. But what makes the web grow is us that put content on it. It's not engineered to grow uh, like a natural system. It's we, the people, that put the content on, link it up, and then governments and big companies regulate and determine the policies that happen, or, or they self-evolve. So we felt we had to establish a new discipline for good or bad. We called it web science in, in, the, um, 
in the, in the grand sense of science. There were, Jim was the fifth beetle. And uh, <laughs> um, basically, it's very interdisciplinary, and this is tr we're trying to capture with, with what we're doing, that you need lots of different subjects to, it's not, uh, to, 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 to bring together, to analyze these, to, to, to try and solve these problems, but it's not. I did try and put communications on. I put networks on this morning. It's not the union of all these disciplines, but it's more than the intersection. And different places will do different uh, partnerships in these disciplines to, to, to do the studying. Uh, but this isn't a, a web science talk, but I will just show you this one because it sort of came up yesterday, and, and then I'll come to a conclusion. We, this was something that came off Tim's whiteboard when we were working out what web science was, and these are the, the moments we don't understand. Basically, people... You have a problem and people have a bright idea. Someone like Tim has a bright idea about how to share documents on the internet. And you design it. This is the engineering piece against the social need. But you have to build it in the small. This is the thing that's different about the web to the way we build other systems. You have to build it as a small... And you can't test it in any way except to put it out there and see what people will do with it. And some things take off and some things don't. And this is the piece we need to try and understand. Once it's taken off, you can analyze it, work out where it's, what's going wrong, what's good about it, try and re-engineer it to make it better, but you keep on going around this loop. So you can put the Google story against that as well. Um, so we study structure, we study things like the, how the, the blogosphere came about, how it works, how it's growing, we study collective intelligence, we study linked data. We study uh, how we might develop rules for information accountability. And we write papers. And here's our little red book, which has been translated to Chinese as well, but I couldn't find that on the internet this morning. Um, and um, we've actually grown up. We've just become the trust. We're a charitable trust now in the UK, independent of Southampton MIT. We've been joined by NOSH um, uh, to help us take all this forward. Um, and we run conferences and we run workshops and summer schools and we're about to announce a new network and this is why I was asking Bruno about I always used to say we want to have a network of laboratories so the whole will be graced in some of the parts I learnt last night when I was awake that I mustn't say that anymore. that's not the thing this is we're creating a network of networks here and uh, all these uh, schools will have a web science lab and we're sort of saying, this is our network that's going to help us grow this subject. Um, and that's my last slide. The thing that I want to just leave you with is the fact that, you know, nobody owns this web thing. It evolves under rules we don't understand. There are scenarios in which it could die. And we could quite ha we could kill it. So this is, we feel, you know, it's... It's an essential part of humanity, but Tim's major point at the moment is less than 25% of the world have access to it, so he's trying, you know, that's why he's spending a lot of time in Africa. And, um, you know, um, I hope to us going forward, the things I've, the study of this, and, and as Nigel's going to talk to you about how the semantic web may or may not is emerging now, is a really important thing going forward. And uh, thank you all very much for listening. Sorry, that was a bit have, long. We still have, we still have time for questions and comments. Exactly. So, show of hands, the conversation again. Okay. So very much just a basic clarifying question. But when you said you type in something like, where, does, where can I study journalism? And, and so instead of having a series of links pop up, you'll have an answer given back because all the links are machine readable and, and they can do the processing that I would do by selecting links. Yeah. But when you say, where is the best place to study journalism? How do machine, how would you, how would the best be? Right. Well, this is, um, I say, I use that example. Again, not, you'll know more after Nigel's talk, but I use that example because in the UK we have these awful league tables that tell us how good we are at research. Well, you have the world university rankings and things like that, and we all, but I think that, that um, so you can imagine where some, a company will determine what best means, <laughs> and they will use data. So they'll use league tables, they'll use, um, uh, citation rankings, they'll use... I mean, we, this is how the Times Higher Ed in the UK is creating its world list of... It doesn't use linked data, but it's creating a, a, its world ranking of universities. And when all the, when all the data's out there, 
anybody can come along and aggregate it. So it will be very interesting because you can imagine um, a, a, an application uh, that students will look at that will tell you where the best place to study journalism is. Um, this leads us to all sorts of problems. Will people pay to be the top of that list or will it be very pure and done on the analysis of data that's out there that, or will it be done by student voting, you know? So what, the only experience I have with anything like this is, is in the construction of index numbers and economic theory, which is a, similar in the sense that you have multiple different kinds of data yeah. and you want to combine into a single numerical index, right? Yeah. And, and there, I think one thing that people are finding is that without a clear normative prioritization of, of how the different numbers, you check with GDP calculations, this is a common complaint of people that develop the funds. Without a clear prioritization of which numbers should have priority for which reasons, and those reasons aren't given by the numbers Absolutely, themselves. yeah. Without an interpretive framework, you can't make an index, you can't make a, a single index number out of them. So yeah. how would the semantic web kind of extract that and prioritize that in a way that would give a single Nigel index? is going to talk a bit about okay. that. He's not, but, and, you know, it's a bit difficult because he's going to fill in the gaps and do all the fun stuff with the data. But um, those are really big questions, and that's why we would include e economists as people we want in our web science world, because those are the very things, you know, what's value in this world? What's well, it going to mean? Yeah. Well, all right, won't I? But, you know. <laughs> but that sort of analysis we've got to go through. And, you know, you can see all sorts of scams that people will... There's always a bad to any good um, uh, on the web as with anywhere else. And, uh, you know, when, you, when you're getting answers back, you have to know where those answers are coming from and how much you trust them. And, you know, th this is all going to be something we're going to have to work out in this world. Bruno, one of my students at Cornell is, is, is actually working on, on this question uh, with, with Google, on Google My Maps. And, uh, and, and the premise that we're starting from is that there's no such thing as the best place to do anything. Uh, it's going to depend on each person. So, um, and one of the nice things about Google is that you can then uh, have the voting for what's the best coming just from your network. So because of Google Mail, assuming you have to assume here that everybody's on Google Mail. So yes, Google, but that's a bit of a scary thing. Yeah, <laughs> but, anyway. but they're not so unrealistic. So now, so now the system knows who your network is, and so it looks inside, it finds the people who are similar to you either by node attributes or uh, by network, act, by relational attributes, and weights their preferences so that you would then uh, so the example would be, okay, I'm in Paris, where should I go for coffee? So it looks at your network to see who's gone to Paris and what they might have said. Now this obviously only works, you have to assume here that everybody's doing it and everybody's giving lots of opinions. Yeah. And under that assumption, you would, this would work. Uh, so uh, Google's pretty excited about it. I wouldn't trust my friends she's, with she's, those questions. I want outsiders. Yeah, so, but, but I mean, the, the, the right. important point here is that there's no such thing as the one answer of what's the best. So then the trick is how to get how, you accumulate. how to get it relative to what's like, what are you likely to think is the best, given uh, some way of, of, of knowing what that and what is will from be the most network. what will right. be the most trusted um, right. service? It's, and also, it will be different in different countries, and it will be hard to, you know, it won't be necessarily comparing chalk with cheese. In the UK, for example, our government produces a ranked list of every subject in it, discipline that we teach. So you, can, you, you have a list of, you know, who are the best computer science departments, best of electronics, best French, best human, you know. We have those lists. They're published by the government. Uh, for every discipline in every university. Now, that won't exist in other countries, so you won't be comparing... Anyway, these are, it's fraught with problems, but these, this is what's going to... I think, uh, didn't Bruno have a question? No? No, it's a question which is what is the dimension you had of a, the way the standards were actually produced. Mm. And you say it's, it's basically built in a room, which is basically <laughs> like this. No, it's done on a virtual, on a which network. Which is, by the way, nice case of a the whole being much smaller. Than the <laughs> yeah. So organization, it's interesting. Is there a literature on that on the way it's produced? I mean, the way the standards are produced in this organization? Well, the web standards are produced like they are, the internet standards are. So um, what will happen is someone will say, we're going to do a standard for video on the web. Or the World Wide Web Consortium, the, the committee, which is led by Tim, which as we said yesterday, is a bit of a benign autocracy because basically he's still very much in command. But... Um, they will decide we're going to do video on the web, so we'll create a working group. And they'll decide who's going to chair it, and then anyone who's a member of W3C, so that's all the big companies, the telecoms, the big IT companies, 
the big farmers, all members and universities, they then pick a team or you, you look, ask for volunteers to join that working group and they may work for a year or more to develop the standard and it's very tedious, laborious work and some people just love it. Um, but, you know, you, and then they publish it in its draft form, it's discussed, they iterate it and they put forward a final draft, a final document and they, there's a vote. And if it's voted and then they announce this is the standard from W3C. And generally, these days, because of the established track record, W3C standards are accepted as the universal standards. And we'd have to think what would happen if that didn't exist, that mechanism, going forward. Oh, sorry, um, I've got... I, I remember about 15 years ago, there was a big discussion in education circles about using computers in schools and how this might restrict what you teach because... Uh, you would teach only what would be represented on a computer. And of course, in those days, the computers were much simpler, as you showed. All this sophistication came in eventually. But I think now uh, you could also say that these machines of Web 3.0 obviously have their limitations, whatever they are. And so there is a danger, maybe, that what we call knowledge or what we call legitimate questions, legit, legitimate research, might be restricted to what can represent it on the web. Well, pe people said that about the first web. Uh, and, and it was true. When the web was be in its early days, yeah. there's no way you would say the web had all of the world's knowledge on it. Right? And, and librarians were quite right to say kids shouldn't be studying on the web because it's a very limited, narrow view of what the world is. I remember, you remember I said, how, could he, how dare he call it the World Wide Web? But actually, of course, now, everything you want to know is essentially on the web. I mean, of course, there are, all, there are legacy documents that aren't on the web still, but all the, I would argue, more or less, that in the world where the web exists, Anything you need to know, any organization that has information that it wants to produce, it's on the web. And so, and even, um, you know, if you think of our PhD students, um, even, if they, even if the actual paper isn't on the web, the catalog entry will be. So uh, you'll find out about it on the web. And it, that's, this is what will happen with the linked data web. To start with, it will be a very poor environment. But as it grows and gets out through the tipping points, everything will be there if, it's, if it does take off, but we can't guarantee it will. I'm not so much wondering how many answers you will get, and how many <laughs> you will get answers, but what kind of questions one Yes, ask? yes, yeah. That's an interesting... Uh, well, I, again, I think that's something we, we, uh, we don't know for sure yet. Um, we're beginning to... I mean, actually, it, it, I don't think it's... It's, it's pretty limitless... Um, I think we're only bounded by our imaginations as to what is going to be possible in this new world of data, linked data. It's going to be so much richer than the one we have at the moment. We have one more question. Your there were two hands up. I okay, take your hand up. Um, so, so I just want to make sure that I... I think I understood the question you were getting here as, as, as a somewhat deeper challenge to the the model of a relationship between Web 2.0 and 3.0, which is to say the extent to which um, the move is to link data or the move is to link social and behavioral uh, uh, insights. And so that in turn asks the question of whether or not uh, uh, the critical change will be a rigid description of um, behavioral measures of um, I like this and this and this and therefore you like that and that. So, so the thing that the thing that that, that that was pushed in both of these is that human judgment about the best this or the best that, anything that's complex, um, is going to be what we see in Web 2.0 is a continuous increase in the importance of the ability to pool human judgment sure. about things that have human need. Sure. And the question is the degree to which the semantic web, if you imagine it as a web 3.0, supersedes that, of which I'd be skeptical, or the extent to which the description is rich enough, or perhaps even most importantly, as a way of facilitating that.
social okay. and behavioral <coughs> So I, I wasn't claiming that. I don't think we can assume that. We have a web, we have a, the web 2.0 is based on a web of documents and recommendation systems within that. But what the point is that when the data's out there, the recommendations will be able to be that much finer. Um, and we don't, we don't know what that's going to do in terms of the, the, the human behavior. We don't know how it's going to affect human behavior, and we don't know how, because human behavior affects the development of the system. When apps builders see people doing things, then they go and build the app to enable them to do it better. So it feeds on itself uh, very much. And w this, is, this is the point of web science, is trying to work through that very complex question. We could have a whole workshop just on that. We, we don't know. We won't know until it happens. It seems to me, I mean, you want to go back to some points that were made earlier, it seems to me you just sort of said, well, this is sort of limitless. Um, but it seems to me there is a clear limit in this, in this representation system, and the limit is actually what's suggested by some of the earlier questions. And that is that this is still based on the idea when you associate connections or associations with the data object itself, it still in a sense treats them as if associations are part of data object. And in a sense, it assumes a kind of, if I'm understanding it right, for want of a better term, an objective model of association. There's, you know, if I have a particular Wikipedia page and there's a fact and that Wikipedia page is linked to other things, that is in that particular place. But associations in practice are always relevant to some kind of model of knowledge. I mean, in, to yeah. put it in a yeah, concrete yes. context, if I have two, say I have two random variables, and I mean, I'm Bayesian, so I think if two people with different prior knowledge come and think about those two random variables, they're allowed to talk to each other, they might have very different ideas about the associations among those random variables. And you put it in a more concrete context, you know, under, under one ontology, two things might be linked, and another ontology, those same two things, they might exist, but they might not have a connection. Um, now, in principle, you could say, well, let's deal with this by, we'll just put every possible connection in there, but obviously you can't do that. Um, and yet, for particular applications, right, you're going to need particular overlays, particular sense of associations for mm. one application, not for another. And that mm. is related to this issue of trust and, and judgment I'm not, as well. I'm not going to, it's time to hand over to Nigel, and you might get a better insight on what linked data is going to be when you've heard him. But I would just point you back to what happened with the web, because you could have argued exactly the same with the web of documents. You can't put every link in there. Sure, no, it is true so, for that. So, so the search engines have enabled us to make sense of that world and some we will have development of something like that for the web of linked data right but, but I mean, well okay i mean i don't want to i don't want to overstate it. i'm not saying is it therefore the semantic web is useless so i'm not saying no no i understand i'm mean, saying i am just saying if you want to say if you want to look at the technology just as just as you did you said you could, we could look at what, what the first uh, generation of the web was and we could see we could, we might, we're going to guess where the technology would go. We might do it by saying, what was the limitation that that had, just looking at documents? Yeah. And, you know, you might say, well, it didn't link people and it didn't link concepts. Yeah. Well, it seems to me, if we look at what people are saying they want to do with this thing, the very first thing you're seeing is people want to be able to project and have essentially a, a perspective, if you yeah. want, a, a subjective well, read of association. Why don't we? Sounds, so if you're going to guess where it might yeah. go, that seems like Why don't we let Nigel show you what people are doing with it? Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.